The fundamental challenge facing societies in which disabled uh, people exist is not that there are too many disabled people. The solution does not lie in the eugenic idea that we need to get rid of these disabled people. The response of these individuals should be to acknowledge that, that their lives have dignity and meaning and value that's just as realizable as that of any other human being. And that when parents believe that it will be in the best interest of their community and for the dignity of their child's own life to be born with disabilities, which they also have, they should be allowed to do it. There is a reason why ever since the 1960s, the deaf community and the community of people of dwarfism have very, very strongly advocated for this policy because it's valuable to their culture and their dignity and we are happy to stand up the rights of parents to do this to their children. Our policy is very simple. If you have a disability, you may inflict your child with that disability. Presumably technology exists that will let you do that. In practice, we're talking about very closely knit, pre-existing, dwarfic and deaf communities that already have facilities to cater for these sorts of people with these disabilities. I have three arguments today. Firstly, why it is moral for parents to exercise this choice in the first instance. Secondly, why this has beneficial effects for the parent-child relationship, and thirdly, why this is beneficial for the existence of cultures that exist or thank you among disabled communities. Firstly, therefore, on the issue of morality. We in society believe that bringing life into the world is always and everywhere a moral good. The reason is because life is a fundamental value on which everyone in society agrees and from which all our other values flow. That it's because life is so valuable that we give parents a vast degree of choice over the way in which they exercise the capacity to bring a child to the world. Here is one example. <laughs> we let parents kill their children because we let them abort their child. They, in their world, they would tell a parent who wants to have a disabled child, you are not allowed to have a disabled child. You, if you don't want to have a, like, a normal child, you should abort this child. You are explicitly making a value judgment that says the life of a disabled person is literally not worth living because you would rather that child not exist in the first place. We don't think that's legitimate. We think that because abortion is legitimate, the capacity for parents to exercise the rights to name their children is also legitimate. No, thank you. But even if they want to say this limits the, uh, the life choices of the child, yes, it does. But lots of things limit the life choices of a child. We don't see why we should fetishize disability more than we fetishize poverty, for instance. A child born in the Bronx in New York has fewer life choices available to him than a disabled child who's deaf born to a rich family. Unsurprisingly, we don't sterilize the poor. But thank you, no thank you. Here's another analogy that makes things even more clear in, in, in a moral sense, right? In the status quo, we let disabled people with genetic problems marry. It is very, very, very likely that their child will also have a disability. We don't sterilize them. So literally, the only difference between our policy and your policy is that in both cases, parents exercise an active choice to have a child they know is probably going to be disabled. The difference is just like a 10% difference in probability that a child is going to be born disabled. We think these moral distinctions are a nonsense. We think there are tissue of lies brought on the premise that dis disability is fundamentally undignifying and evil and that we should mock and degrade people who are disabled. We think they should be able to exercise this right. If they can murder their children, they can certainly choose to maim them. Secondly, therefore, why this is not for the parent-child relationship, but yes. So, you would allow parents to <coughs> presumably predestine the deafness of their children. Would you allow parents to cut off the ears, cut off the ears or burst the eardrums of a child born with hearing? We think that's a purely utilitarian question and we're not really sure what the answer to that is. Like, presumably actively harming a child causes grief to them in a way that ensuring that they're born with something doesn't cause grief to them because they haven't ex ex experienced the alternate life, right? We don't think a fetishization of the chances that a child has to experience something is valuable. We think the actual lived experiences of happiness are what we should talk about in this debate. So secondly, therefore, the parent-child relationship. We think that parents have legitimate moral claim, especially disabled parents, deaf parents, or dwarfic parents, to say that this is important for the way in which they relate to their child. In the status quo, if you are a parent who suffers from dwarfism, you can never truly hold the hand of a child as you walk on the reading aisle. You cannot even carry them back 
from school, after soccer practice. The capacity for you to relate to a child meaningfully is vastly constricted because they inhabit literally a different sensorial universe from the one you live in. A deaf parent who has a child who isn't deaf and therefore rarely uses sign language except at home and is very not fluent in it, can never truly share the first heartbreak of a child, can never truly relate to their child, can never properly offer their child emotional support for a parent that's so crucial to your psychological <coughs> development, never truly properly discipline in that child in a way that the child will actually take to heart and not just roll their eyes at, right? Recognize that a parent can legitimately say, I want to be able to carry my child back from football practice. That's a meaningful and beautiful experience that I treasure as a human being, and that's something that will be cut out. No, thank you. Obviously, there are costs to guaranteeing this, but just as we allow parents to weigh up the costs and benefits of things all the time when it comes to whether or not you get cancer treatment and live or die, we think this is legitimate to make as well, right? We do not think furthermore that the argument that over oh, the child will grow up and resent their parent holds. Because firstly, if you really believe that, you wouldn't really let poor parents have kids, which is a bit creepy. But secondly, we don't think that this actually happens. Because the parents who choose to inflict their children with disabilities are parents who already live in disabled communities, right? Like disabled communities in Minnesota, in Pennsylvania, in New York, where already 99% of the people who live in this neighborhood are already deaf, where amenities are already extremely sure. good, no thank you, and where schools specialize in, in training these people to go into different jobs and giving you the skills you need to go out and live a good life. So we don't think that's a concern. Thirdly, therefore, um, the culture of disabled communities, no thank you. We think that disabled communities have created their own extremely unique, no thank you, and valuable culture, right? Deaf individuals have their own deaf place where people learn to act and simultaneously use hand signals. It's a very special and unique art form that very few people are able to master or indeed understand, right? There are many different species of sign language. Sino-Japanese sign language is very different in its emotional inflections from US-UK sign language. Many people in the deaf community are outraged when deaf people try to communicate with them using, to quote, to quote their term, right, the expressions of normal people, right? They want specific deaf ways of communicating and you think that's valuable culture. Look, societies are always going to have individuals who are disabled. We need to treat them as being dignified, right? The solution, therefore, comes in the form of these sorts of cultures which value these people in a way that no other cultures do. And the reason why having children who are born with these disabilities is important is because if you don't have children born with these disabilities, these cultures inevitably die out. But if your child is born normal and healthy, zero incentive in many cases, or at least very little incentive, to actually bother to learn sign language, bother to learn to watch deaf plays, or bother to enter dwarfic culture. A parent might well say, I want my child to celebrate this culture with me in the same way I do, and if that requires him being born the way I am, I'm happy for that to be the case. It's exactly the same with religion and parents. I'm extremely proud to propose here. Today. First of all, on the rights of the parents, where I'm going to debunk it on three levels they brought up. On the idea of choice, on the idea of <coughs> relatability, on the idea of existing precedents. And secondly, I'm going to forward our substantive about how like, um, uh, we, we think that um, allowing disabled parents to ensure that their children are born disabled results in a greater division between the abled and disabled communities and causes the falling of existing bridges, which we think is exceptionally harmful. First issue, rights of the parents. Three levels. First, on choice. Because they seem to think that, oh, you know, Parents have the choice to shape a great deal of your lives. We completely agree, but we think it's important here to make a distinction between soft influencers and hard influencers. <coughs> there are soft influencers where you may persuade your child um, to do certain activities. You may persuade your child to take up debates instead of sports because sports gives you like skin cancer, and debates gives you intelligence. But you don't actually like force your child to like stay yeah, indoors yeah. and debate <laughs> and trap them into a room, right? We think that the reason like and, and we draw this distinction between the fact that 
with soft influences, right? It's advice that you share with your children. It's things that they can still like get rid of. It's things that they can still like reject. Sure. However, hard influences are what you guys are trying to advocate. The physical removal of these organs pre-birth, right? We don't think that it's the same thing. We think that when parents in the status quo try to remove their children's <coughs> organs, that's actually considered abuse. When you actually physically harm your child or you stunt your child's growth through malnutrition, you are actually called out on abuse. That is a hard influence that we do not accept in the, in the, in the status quo sure, because you are objectively harming your child. We don't think that being, dis uh, being disabled is necessarily a bad thing, but we do have to concede that it makes your life more difficult. You are able to live with other communities, but instead of being someone that can just um, see what's around you, you have to learn Braille code and uh, constantly be in a place where you know, you're able to like, uh, read, through, read through your thing. So I think that in those situations, right, like basically there's a difference between soft influencers and hard influencers. We think that in the status quo, we don't allow for hard influencers already, therefore your analogy doesn't stand. Secondly, on relate, relate, relatability, we need to recognize this. Parents have the right to shape the child, but we also need to recognize that we want to maximize the range of potential lived experiences that they have. When you want your children to relate to you, that is something that can easily be done regardless of whether they are able or not. There is reversibility on our end. A child can be born with, a, with, a, with, a, with sight, right? But can, you can have that child walk around blindfolded and try to maneuver around the house for a few days if the child really cannot relate. In fact, the best part about our side is that you can do that activity to a child when they are older, when they are about 14 or 15 and are truly mature enough to understand what exactly you're trying to do to them, to understand that you're trying to make them more empathetic. And we think that that's the best solution because it's up to the child, the child is mature enough to understand, that's where you're going to get the desired outcome that you want, that the child will understand the way that you truly live. So we think that, but moreover, right, we think that if they want to talk about relatability, right, that, you know, I should be able to hold my child and carry my child to and from soccer practice, right, but we think that similarly, your child should also be able to relate to the rest of the world, but now you're actively denying your child that opportunity. We think that in, in, in our situation, the child is able to relate to a greater people, to the majority of the world, who are in fact able. So if you tell us that all sensory experiences are important, our side provides a different yes, range of those experiences, and we think that's precisely why we want to maximize the range of potential lived experiences. But most importantly, the nuance that I'm bringing forth here is the idea of reversibility that's a better test for empathy than your side. Last but not least, we're on the existing precedences. That, oh, you know, the disabled people have children, they are likely to be disabled. Yes, but in those situations, you do not actively choose for your child to be disabled. You're not marrying somebody disabled so that your child will be disabled. The, the, the child is born with a disability without any active agency on your part. However, what their policy supposes is that a parent is going to make the active choice to take something away from the child. We think that's not going to result in empathy. That's going to result in resentment when the child finds difficulty in living in their lives. We think that these people, uh, as they grow up, right, disabilities are not easy things to live with. Even if you have the most perfect facilities, it takes time to acclimatize yourself to them. So forever, like, forever you have to, like, like, in order to hear, you have to remember to put on your hearing aid every day. At some point in time, some resentment is going to happen. And we think that now, instead of just saying, you know, I'm instead of just going, oh, I, I was just born with it, I have to live with it, they are going to blame their parents for their choice. So we think that the existing precedents don't exist in terms of genetics. We think that uh, this is very different because agency is there. We think it's ethically problematic and we think that it's actually <coughs> harming them. Before I move on to my substantive, yes. So uh, <coughs> your case rests on the moral idea that it's a difference between soft and hard influences on unborn children. Do you think abortion is a soft or hard influence? Right. We think that we are we think that the difference in these situations, right? Like you are allowed to abort your child, but in this situation, you are physically the physical removal of organs post birth is an act is an, is an abuse of the child. So the, in a similar scenario, right, harming your child within um, the womb is also um, a hard influence. Next next issue, resulting uh, next uh, yeah, my substantive right. Greater this division between the able and disabled community. Two levels. First, we think there's going to be a purpose incentive for you to, to actually um, increase the numbers of your community. We think that within the disabled community, it's not as if you, it's not as if what you say, right? That there are large numbers of them and they have enough facilities. They are going. We think that parents here are going to want to increase their numbers in this way. But more importantly, right? We think that in fact, you can't tell me that the average parent is going to try. They they want their child to relate to them. In fact, we think that they are going to make this choice because they are compelled, simply because their community is so close to the outside world. They are going to feel compelled to make this choice. It's not going to be an active choice on the part of these parents. And that's the main problem here, that you are giving them a choice only to have them be compelled in those situations. What's going to happen, the ultimate end goal, the ultimate like, conclusion of that, right, is that the identity of the disabled becomes even more exclusive than it already is in the status quo. It's harder for you to be attempt 
to be able to like devices such as hearing aids because now you have to be disabled in order to be part of the community. You're entrenching the fact that only the disabled can truly understand you. Which means that if you want to be accepted in the deaf community, don't use a hearing aid, which actually is already no problem. Yeah, right. It's already a thing in the status quo. We shouldn't make life more difficult for them because they do actually need to interact with the able community. That is a fact that we have to live with, that opening government has to deal with. We think it also, so we think that here it closes up the ranks and it makes a greater divide between the able and the disabled community and it allows them to make that greater divide if they want to if they want to do that and that's bad. But more importantly, we don't even think that it's an issue of agency because the parents aren't going to have that. Secondly, right, we think that in the status quo, the children of disabled parents make an excellent bridge between the disabled community and the able community because they are able to live an able life as well as look at the difficulties that the disabled parents have and compare and contrast. That is where true empathy occurs because you can see how easy your life is as compared to the other. That is when you are motivated to take efforts to do something to improve their lives. The empathy that you desire only exists towards their parents but not throughout, not like outwards throughout the greater community. We want these children to exist because they make a good bridge. But more importantly, we think that we think that the parents don't have real agency in this matter, and even if they did, they shouldn't be given the agency to name their child. Thanks. <laughs> Two questions on rebuttal. Number one, what choices can parents make? Number two, what experiences and communities can they share with children? Number one, what choices can parents make? Opposition's argument was that you can't make choices that are irreversible and that are hard choices. For instance, removing your child's ears. First of all, I'd like to point out that this is a misrepresentation of our case. In no way do we advocate cutting off children's ears, causing them much bloodshed, as well as like pain and trauma from you know finding that organs that were once there were no longer there. This to me is well, if we could and had the technology to do so, give them disabilities before they knew what life was like without them. Hence, fully immersing them in the experience in the same way every other human being who has a disability goes through. So, no, that's a misrepresentation. It's not about abuse. What then is the logic with regard to soft and hard instances? What choices can parents already make? These choices include things like having an abortion, but not just that. They include choices like religion, like being in an Amish community, which significantly changes your life outlook from the moment you're born. It is choices like your race, because if you choose to have a marriage and have children with someone else from a mixed race or the same race, that has massive ramifications of how your life will turn out. All of these are very hard choices, in that once a decision is made, they are irreversible, and they are fairly active decisions to do so. We acknowledge then that in any of these cases, the full spectrum of choices might be valuable. Having a religion, not having a religion, what type of religion to have. That being said, because all of them are valuable, we privilege the parents and the mother's or the father's choice and their right to make this decision for the child. So team opposition needs to tell us why this very moral bedrock of the rights of a mother and the rights of a family need to go down beyond a false distinction of hard and soft choice. Second question, what can parents share? We think this argument is split into two areas. First, experience. Second, community. Experience. Ashish told you it was fundamentally important for a parent to be able to share certain experiences with his or her children. Opposition's response was quite trivial. At the age of 15, you can walk around blindfolded and clearly you will know what it's like to be a blind person. This is a gross oversimplification of the problem of the kind that we teach our children to get them to understand what it's like to be blind. And this has failed because there's a big difference between being blind for like five to 10 minutes and understanding what kind of life you have to lead and why this changes your life in a totally different way. So that's not a good response. No, so, well, thank you. More importantly, the fact that it is reversible dilutes the experience because you know it's only something you have to put up with in five to 10 minutes. It doesn't read true understanding. So these alternatives fail. In fact, we think it's very important for parents to be able to share experiences with their children. Think about it. With regards to the point of resentment, when do children feel resentful? 
They don't feel resentful because of arbitrary factors like how rich their parents were. Whether or not you have a rich parent, whether or not you have a parent who was at home a lot, whether or not you have a parent who was like a single parent family, or was black or white or any other race, these aren't the factors that people look at when they look at anthropology and whether children felt semblances of love and care for their parents. The most important thing was, do we have a memory together? Do we share and build a bond together? Was it meaningful? Was it real? Or was it artificial? Or was it false? Real memories come about when a parent who is a dwarf can walk his daughter down the aisle without impediments or without using a tool, where parents who are blind can listen to the descriptions of their equally blind daughter and understand what beauty is to the girl who has fallen in love. These are the experiences that that build bridges to communities and that take down resentment. So if you truly so, believe resentment is a problem, well, thank you. It won't be about arbitrary factors like race, like money, or like disability. It will be about their ability to connect, and outside does that far better. Second thing that parents have to share. No, thank you. Communities. We told you why certain communities were very important. The response to this was, all oh, these communities can be bad things. They are now compelled to join these communities, and they become very exclusive. For instance, you can no longer use hearing aids. Um, we think that lots of community, communities tend to be very diverse and they allow you to make multiple choices. So some members of these communities feel that AIDS are important, some of them don't. So thank you. More importantly, these are arguments against you know, any other major life choice that parents can voice upon you, like religion. See, the thing about it is that any identity that parents choose to give you and endow you with, to some extent, will be compelled upon you, to some extent, will be exclusive. That's a fundamental nature of identity. The reason why it's okay to do this is because we, again, acknowledge the rights of parents to make these decisions for their children. Because it's important that the bond that is created and the place of the child in the future society or community he or she will grow up in is secure. So that's why we allow parents to make medical decisions based on religious reasons. We think the logic is the same. Finally, like leading to last point in a moment, sir, was that we now lose bridges to these communities. We have two responses. One, bridges will still exist because not every parent will take on this policy. We think that those individuals can still put the <coughs> role. Second of all, the bridge is more strongly tethered on our side because it's easier to be a member of the dis dis uh, disabled community and reach out to the normal community than vice versa. Because it's often when you're in that community that you can fully understand what's really hard to understand, it's more likely that they're going to be open up to you and listen to you when you try and make these connections in the first place. So the relationship doesn't work equally on both sides. Yes? Is it a good or bad thing to be disabled? Uh, <clears throat> we think it's a thing that is worth <laughs> respecting in the same way it's alright, not a good or bad thing like that I'm male and some of you are female, that some of us are Chinese, some of us are mixed race, and so on and so forth. Okay, my point of extension. We think it's a good thing to break down disability as a social construct. We think the impact of disabilities are always relative. For instance, to some disabled people, it's just a different way of living, it's an adjustment they have to make, but they're often very proud of it, they don't try to hide it, even if their disability can be hidden. But to lots of us in society, it's imbued with semblances of pity and regret. Thank God I'm not like that person, thank God my child wasn't blind even though there was a chance he or she could have been. This is a gap of understanding, thank you. and we want disability to lose its status as a form of stigma in society. We think we like to create a society where disability isn't shunned and where normalcy or being perfect as a human being isn't something that is fetishized. We already accept this is the case when it comes to physical beauty. We think this should be the case in the case of physical health and well-being as well. We think this is, this is three main impacts. First of all, quite intuitively, when you have larger communities, you tend to have more political progress. You know, policies and discussions that are more suited for minorities in, in dis disabled areas. But this isn't so important compared to the other two. First of all, second of all, there's greater self-empowerment and confidence because in the past, in the present, sorry, you dare to be different in ways that you weren't before. Again, you don't have to strive to be a perfect individual or a perfect body image. But third and most crucially of all, this deals with the idea of opportunity. It redefines opportunities in society. In the past, people said black people could be bank tellers because white people wouldn't be willing to divulge information to them. We think this was irrelevant. We would like a society where as more and more individuals are disabled, we ask whether being small, being deaf, or being blind is, cru is truly crucial to a particular job. And we think the answer in a lot of these cases will be no, especially with technologies and opportunities being created in more progressive societies. When this happens, and we remove factors that inherently disqualify you from a job, we take away the harms that team opposition tries to talk about. Because we believe opportunities will develop and evolve in ways that will include these communities. And that's a good thing for their future vis-a-vis -vis the rest of society. For all these reasons, we're very proud to stand in government.
let's start with some <coughs> uncontroversial assumptions that both sides of the debate want to accept. We both want to prioritize lived experiences and ability to maximize and make choices about those opportunities and lived experiences. The other side of the house, on the other hand, was willing to deny some people the ability to choose from the widest possible range of these lived experiences by denying them the choice not even midway through their life, which they were clearly be unwilling to do, but before we even started living. We thought they defended this on spurious ethical grounds. So let's jump straight into it. I've got two spheres of this debate to discuss. Firstly about ethics, and secondly about what happens in the real world. So on ethics, I have a laundry list of rebuttals. I'm going to try to be clear as and when I'm moving from one to the other. But essentially, this sphere of the debate, right, is about appealing to our moral intuitions um, and like answering the attempts to answer tests against our moral intuitions that we've heard from psychology. So the first thing we heard from them, right, is that life is good. In all instances, life is a virtue, and therefore, to the extent to which we're willing to mitigate this by allowing people to afford, that's why we can also allow other choices we make prior to birth. Like, one, we don't agree that life is a virtue. Like, that's why we don't go around saying everyone should have children all the time, right? Like, it is not about the net benefit of bringing life into the world. It is about the range of the lived experiences of that particular life where the virtue of life lies. Life is in itself a virtue. So that's why, right, there was a clear difference between the right to abort and the right to maim your children prior to abortion. And the difference here was that in abortion, if we buy that existence isn't a virtue, there is no difference between the child not existing and the child existing, because existence isn't a virtue. In this case, because you are planning the life of the child after the fact, there is a distinction in the choices you're making. So there was actually no meaningful distinction between the scenarios I pointed out in my point of information. When I asked you, would you be willing to burst the eardrums of a child after birth? And their answer was, we wouldn't, but only because of the direct physical harm experienced by the child in that moment. That wasn't the most important thing, Madam Speaker, because the most important thing was the list of the long laundry list of lived experiences that a child would be denied from. They were happy to deny the choice. They we weren't. No, thank you. Okay, they then told us there is no difference between the limitation of life choices here and the general degree of parental influence. We never had a, com a convincing response to Lee material about the line between soft and hard influences. No thank you. Sir. And the reason here was because we gave you two tests. We gave you a test of reversibility. They never convincingly engaged with that. They just said that religion or born into a different community or social economic circumstance has the potential to affect you in profound ways. Yes, it does, Madam Speaker, but it will never as profound as the absolute deprivation of a set of sensory experiences with no chance ever to experience them again. So there was a significant test. And then the next thing they told us was the test in significance it right, wasn't important because the only way in which we can assess our experiences is in comparison to experiences we could have had. Now that was bizarre, because to the extent to which that is the case, then we should not care about people born into poverty. We should diminish the range of experiences they don't get to have, because it doesn't matter. They were never able to imagine or have those experiences in the first place. That is clearly not how our moral intuitions ever were going to work. So to the extent to which our ethical, our entire ethical framework in like the way we debate things and the way we assess whether things are good or bad is based on the ability of individuals to make meaningful choices for their lives and have the, the biggest possible range of choices with regards to which they can make those individual choices for. We think it was particularly important that in these cases parents deny their children agency. Yes. So, your moral rebuttal to our claim is that the lives of disabled persons are generally so much more misery than happiness that their existence is not a virtue. Why aren't they committing suicide in droves? Well, like, no. Existence is never a virtue for anyone. That, that was the point, right? You don't, if, if a person wants to commit suicide because that person individually wishes to choose to commit suicide, that's that individual person's choice and agency. Your policy denied some people the ability to even make choices in the first place, and the only justification you had was they never had the ability to know what the choice might look like. That was fatuous, because psychological studies about, people, about, about scientific ways in which we can restore hearing to the partially deaf, or restore sight to the partially blind, suggest that you 
way in which we conceptualize of things isn't actually entirely located in those sense experiences. That there was a world of imagination out there where we could imagine what it might be like to hear or like to see. We don't understand these senses well, and it was unreasonable for them to cut these choices out to begin with. Okay, they then said, the relatability of the experience of parents was really important. We asked, why was that more important? Why was that ability of you to relate your parents' experiences and lives more important than the potential ability of their child to relate to every other single person who was able out there? We told you this in Li Jing, they never had a response. So comparatively speaking, no thank you. We thought in terms of the re or comparing the immersal or, or, or removal of responses, we thought it was much better on our side because we gave people because we didn't allow parents to take away the rights of children who didn't have a say. Okay. Next issue on the real world. So here we here this discussion here, right, was about a discussion about whether preserving disabled culture was really important in and of itself, or whether perhaps we might engender a stronger division between the disabled and the able. So they told us that we really need to preserve disabled culture in two main ways. Firstly, by making sure that there's a but no, in fact, in, in one main way. And it was a numbers game, right? They just wanted more disabled people to be out there. Otherwise, somehow disabled culture would fall away and die. Firstly, we didn't agree that this disabled culture had an absolute and meaningful cultural value in and of itself. We thought cultural values were constituted by individuals who chose what they wanted. So to the extent to which that was the case, we thought that was largely value neutral. But more importantly, it's not like the supply of disabled people was finite, right? Like, we didn't have to control that supply via the birth of people who were born there or born in Guatemala. Because people were made disabled in a variety of ways, a variety of ways which we don't, like, say are bad or good, but it happens. We thought it was bizarre for them to say that political progress was the, was, was the, was, was the absolute goal here. Because the significance of minorities should never be measured purely in terms of numbers. Their model meant that a minority was only significant insofar as we got lots and lots of them and they were less of a minority. We thought that was a bad precedent to set because minorities should be reflected proportionate and precise. What they did get, though, was a greater division between the disabled and the able. They lost the bridge of an individual who was able to have more interaction and empathy with both sides of the spectrum and presumably who could speak or advocate for a greater link between disabled and able societies. Even some disabled people fought for utter separation between their world and the world of the able. There were others who were talking about things like um, hearing aids, like creating more integration between the two communities. We thought they silenced those people because we weren't happy for these people to be silenced and because we weren't happy for children to live in silence forever. We are so proud to oppose. Like future, and we think that insofar as parents can choose to avoid. 
for their children. This, this is a, a right that we have never dedicated to children in the first place. And more importantly, like all, all these things, class, status, so, uh, social strata, are things that we can't, uh, we cannot choose, but we are born into. We think that uh, insofar as it is important for a child to be subsumed within a mainstream society, we think that what they didn't answer was that it was important for people within the dis uh, disabled community to feel empowerment, to feel like they don't need to continue to pander to all these like uh, people who are born <coughs> less, uh, without certain physical restrictions. But then they, they brought to us the other idea, second idea, on the idea of the false choice, right? That you know people will feel compelled to opt in. But look, this is something that if, if, if this is a, an active choice that you were able to make, then well, how is this a false choice, right? Because we don't think that it is such an easy decision or like something that you can decide at whim to disable your child if you know that this is something that is excruciating unless you really hate your child. And then to, to that end, we think that that is something that the state doesn't have say over as well until it comes down to like abuse, right? Where does our extension come in today? Firstly, we think that uh, our one extension is that we think that this helps uh, the disabled community be empowered within the types of choices that they make and yeah, that's it, right? Okay, moving on, right? Oftentimes, we think that the ability to break down the, uh, the walls of social isolation is the ability to build your own social <coughs> circle within the terms that you command, right? And we think that this, like, these individuals with disability often get together in the first place, like, uh, they get married and they form, like, uh, you know, communities because that is where they feel the most comfortable. And when they are unable to perpetuate this identity within their own community and within their own means, we think that that uh, further isolates them within. Uh, yeah, uh, we think that this further isolates them from their own community, and that's something that we don't. Uh, yeah, we, we are not propagating. We don't think that dwarfism is just going to die out because we don't allow disabled children to be born disabled, but. In, uh, in the same way, we think that empowerment here means that we are able to uh, uh, allow parents to make these choices actively for their children just uh, to be able to grow into such an experience where dwarfism is no longer seen as a disability but only a, a, a relative um, thing, right? Where it's just an aspect of your life that you are able to trade out because this is such a tangible asset of your identity. What does agency look like for the disabled community? We don't propose that we ghettoize disabled people, right? But we do recognize that what this uh, this proposal might mean is that we do see more uh, communities of people who uh, uh, of um, disabled people who do live together, right? But we think that this is uh, this ability to create these support networks is the uh, main thing where that pushes you know uh, these disabled people forward in trying to create their. Uh, support networks based on their bloodline and being able to negotiate all this sort of social discrimination in the means that they best understand, right? Fundamentally, being able to opt in or out of discrimination depends on whether which frame of mind you're looking at, right? And we think that to that end, like the uh, the mainstream community have exerted like tons and tons of pressures for the uh, disabled community to change and pander to their lifestyle. Like for example, you know, like they'll only have like sideway walks, but you know, like you had C stairs everywhere else until like uh, until a special law specifies it to be. When when we have this sort of community that's allowed to perpetuate, what we'll see is that we'll see a lot more lifestyle choices that are more suited, like intuitively, for these people disabled uh disability to live and uh you know to grow all these lifestyle choices and experience that opening up wanted to talk about. Like the, the only way that they can live out their, uh, their life experience if, is if they were able to make choices the same way that mainstream <coughs> people are able to make. <coughs> right, so what did I bring to you today? Yeah, we, the, the main extension coming from site uh, closing government is that uh, the idea that once you are able to stop pandering your lifestyle to the mainstream community, that is empowerment and that's, the, uh, that, yeah, that, that's what we want for the disabled community and uh yeah the public proposals.
I'm going to bring you the simple yet somewhat very radical proposition, right? That being disabled is tough. And it's not tough because society tells you it's tough. It's tough because it's inherently <coughs> tough. Like, for example, if I was deaf and I wasn't able to hear my favorite music for the rest of my life, I would be sad not because society tells me that this is a sad thing, but because I cannot sense and appreciate that, that, that full life that I was supposed to, right? So, moving on, and, and that's going to be the bulk of the closing opposition's case, right? That, Disability is a tough thing, it's a bad thing, it's a question that they didn't want to deal with. It's a bad thing for the individual, for the individual's family, and also for society. It's tangible harms for these individuals. Right? So let's move on to take down and see why this metric takes down most of the, the, the things that were talked about on the whole of the government bench. Right? Because they came to talk to you, and especially opening government, they came to talk and brought you a lot of positive material about how, like, you know, being disabled like, is a good thing, and you can live a lives life with disabled people. Let's look at the examples that they brought to you as to the, the, the substantive positive benefits of being a disabled person. You said you could live in communities and be disabled together in the community. For one, we don't think that this is actually like the definition of what like, a fulfilled life is, right? And the very fact that you're disabled means you have to victimize yourself and, and, we, and make yourself be no. just within these so. No thanks. So we don't think that this example is a good example of positive benefit from being disabled. Then we brought a few things like languages which you preserve. We think that we don't need to be deaf to like preserve sign language, right? We think that yes, it, it, it gives a good incentive for you to like, pop, to, like to, to carry on the deaf language, the, the sign language if you're deaf, but we think that if the language itself was such a positive benefit independent of their disability. Then we think there are other ways for this so, society to perpetuate that sort, that sort of benefit. Before that, yes, then. Can you feel and appreciate an idea that you never experienced and is this still valuable? Um, no, but I don't see a point in that, so I'm going to move on. Right, so let's now move on with Danny's extension, which came out with this idea of how it changes the way individuals see itself and, and like how we have to make sure that, that these disabled individuals don't handle to like mainstream society. I don't see how that will happen, right? Because in any case, if I'm a disabled person, whether I was born disabled or whether I was turned disabled by my parents, right, I'm going to want to find a way to fit back into the mainstream community. That would, that's independent of whether or not I was born that way or my parents made it that way, right? Why? Because we think that there are opportunities within mainstream society that need to be inclusive, but like communities within like Pennsylvania or Philadelphia that he mentioned, it's not going to be able to provide me. For example, if I want to be an astronaut, for example, like a lawyer, like maybe if we don't have these professions in our community, that's why no matter what, no matter like whether I was born with it, I would have to go back to mainstream society to pander the so-called Danny call Danny says it, to pander to these sorts of like to these sorts of value, mainstream values to like find my place within mainstream society. So we don't think that there are any positive benefits brought up. By the government, but maybe you have one, so yeah. I mean, your case is just a generic description of why being born with genes that are fixed is sucky, right? If you don't think existence has inherent virtue, you must therefore claim that these disabled lives are more unhappiness than happiness. Is that, in fact, your thing? Yes, we think that disabled lives are more happy inherently because of their disability. I don't think you have to disagree with that, right? So let's move on to this model, though, right? Given that, oh, yeah. that I'll prove you later on in my speech that, like, that, Okay, moral point. It's tough to decide whether or not, like, on a moral, like, metric, which, like, opening, like, side really takes its way, right? So let's go back to something that, like, we could, we can act like a real metric that we can base its way on, right? Like, pragmatic, like, like, tangible effects of allowing this policy to pass, right? We think it's harmful for two reasons, right? One, it increases costs on society, which sounds like a really bad, like, hardline point, but I'm just going to run it anyway. And two, why it leads to tangible disadvantages for the disabled community. Well, why does it increase cost in society? I don't think I need to go into much elaboration on this, right? There is a cost in society when you're disabled, right? Think about the communities that they mentioned. Who pays for these communities? Who pays for the setting up of these communities and for these hospitals that, this is, that, these, that these disabled people have to go through? And presumably, the, these masses of disabled people that are not introducing the world have to go through, right? Society is going to bear this cost, right? People are going to pay for these welfare systems that you put in place for these disabled people. Now let's try to claim that some moral high ground, like let's not pretend like it's such a bit, right? Like why is it actually like a bad thing for like other dis disadvantaged people, right? Because the moment you put the, like you think that once you realize that disability comes at the cost of society, then you have to realize that allowing for more disabled people, like but because parents simply want want that to be so because we think it's easier for them to relate their child, that takes money away from like other causes within society, right? That just that's just like shape simple mathematics, right? And and this is and this is sad, right? Because for other disabilities or other disadvantages that you are simply born with or simply natural to you, then you have lesser people trying to give money to you. And we think that that's simply unfair because for one, your parents will live for you and another, you really have no choice in the matter. 
So then you move on the, the tangible to the bunch of the disabled community, right? You think this is a donor fatigue, right? Because what, right now, the whole conception of why people, no thank you, the whole conception as to why people actually give to the disabled community is because you feel sad for them, because you, they're a victim of their circumstances. Under their policy, what changes? This, yeah, they want to champion this disability as long as it should be celebrated, right? But you think this changes the whole conception of how people Okay, yeah, it changes the whole conception of how people view disability. And this is a bad thing, right? Because now people will not be willing to donate your to like your disability causes, right? Because right now what happens is that disability is not a matter of circumstance, but it's something that your parents deliberately chose for you, right? That you have no right to complain over simply because you believe and your family believes it's something they should be championed and should be celebrated. Yeah. Why is this inherently harmful, right? Which because this reliance falls back onto the family itself, right? That people are now going to think that your parents chose this for you, your parents are responsible for you, the rest of society has no part to play in the in like in helping you through this disability. Why is this inherently harmful and needs to get tangible benefits for the disabled community? Because we think that without help from the mainstream community, as they like it, we don't think that this the disabled community can sort of like help itself out of their situations, right? Because like I mean, without like I mean every like even if you're blind, you still need either like a guide dog provided for you by mainstream society, or like people like coming into your community and helping like the community of blind people get through their daily lives, right? For example, like for example like that. So we think that when you allow for this reliance on the family administrator, right, we don't think that, that these disabled sons and daughters are able to like provide for their family in a way that an able-bodied son and daughter would be, simply because, right, when they go back to society, when they want to look for a job to like provide for their family back in their community, what's going to happen is that they need to pander for their job to the mainstream community that you have already alienated and isolated because now you've changed the way the mainstream community views these disabled communities. And that's why it's harmful both on society, both on society and for these families as well, right? Tangible benefits that now the closing government has to deal with and has to deal with in their speech. Thank you.
their day-to-day -day life because family is the domain where they primarily live and learn. Yes, sir. Madam, suppose you have a child who you blind pre-birth. Suppose now the child <coughs> via medical technology is able to see again. Do you think this child accesses a greater range of experiences? No, sir. I don't. Uh, simply because if you have the choice, like how many people have transferred this community? Simply because, simply, like how many of us have planned to go blind simply because we are not born blind and we want to experience the other side of this world. Similarly, we see that very few people in that scenario would be making that choice in the first place. But, uh, but going on to this, in, the, in my second question of bridging the gap between the two communities, I would say that this choice would suddenly become more valid for both the parties, not just one as they would try to make you believe, by, making you, by, by bridging the gap as has been brought forward in the society. Now we have to, now going on to, now showing what this problem of inherent disability <coughs> has brought to this world. Now this, the closing opposition came to this strange argument that people should not be disabled because guess what, it costs money to build ramps. For example, now let me give you this radical idea that even building stairs costs money. <laughs> okay. Where do we spend this money on is what we have seen has inherently disadvantaged one community which should never be happening. Now this, as the previous speaker has said, is compromising the identity of a certain group of their life. Immediately telling them that you are a burden, you are a parasite, you don't live to be, you don't deserve to live and reproduce. And we say this is wrong. So thank you, sir. Now moving on to my second question for this debate. That first, who bridges the gap between these two worlds better? No, 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 thank you, sir. Uh, the first thing we need to understand about bridges is that they are built between equals. Never can we imagine a proper coherence between these two groups in a world where we are inherently seeing one group as disadvantaged to the other. Now understanding in our situation where we live to understand that both are equal and more than that situational, we allow greater mobility between the two languages. Now instead of forcing them to learn brain and putting an inherent value on one script over the other, we obviously try, we have a world when one group is trying to move to the other, is not able to do so, is discriminated because of that, while the other group never even bothers to turn to this other group, to this disabled group, except in cases of pity and charity. Now, pity and charity is not inclusion. No, no, thank you, sir. So currently we see that these groups are, no, thank you, sir, is being marginalized because they are seen as inferior. What we do in our situation, that <coughs> by giving these parents this choice, that a choice, again I point out, is an equally valid and rational one to make, that you bring your child into this world with certain abilities and disabilities, and abilities and disabilities which are situational. By maiming the child is not maiming at all. It is certainly making them simply more equipped to deal with certain situations than the others. A choice that our parents have already made by, for example, not by making, making us both, make, like birthing us into a certain community, a certain socioeconomic status, a certain race, and certain abilities. Now therefore we see that by giving them this choice as a valid and an equal one, we allow greater mobility between the two communities, where one group who have so called been seen as disadvantaged comes over to how they are independent, how they have their own identity, and therefore should be able to fit better in the mainstream world, while people who are in the mainstream world are suddenly seeing these abilities or disabilities as simply a difference without the value judgment on inferior or superior, giving them greater, greater uh, motivation to actually reach out and learn, like learn from their equals to cope in different situations. And therefore we tell you that on the government side and particularly on the closing one where we tell you that inherent disability is nothing, we not only improve the self-worth and identity of these communities and, set, and also bridge the gap between the two worlds that they have artificially created because put in, making one inferior to the other. Therefore, I'm incredibly proud to propose.
Ladies and gentlemen, we are not saying that a disabled person doesn't have a life worth living, but saying that their lives are in no way different or as virtuous as every other single person's life trivializes the struggles, the pains, and the hurt that they had to overcome to get through these lives in the first place. Even if one or two minority groups of people who were so fortunate to have disabled lives that were comfortable and they thought was a life worth sharing, it doesn't detract from the millions of other disabled people who ultimately, whose core wish is to wish that that disability never gets inflicted on anyone else. It is a fortunate, convenient thing for the opening government to use the privileged opinions of people to voice such a moral burden on everyone else. We fundamentally don't believe that it's right for anybody, disabled or not, to hurt anyone else. Consistent with that, we hardly think that it can be right that parents in any way should have the ability to hurt their very own children. We have two important questions in this debate. First, whether or not this principle stance is moral, and second, whether or not we should allow this to happen. First, is it moral? And there's not a lot I can say about this without sounding like the opening opposition, but I'll try. <laughs> the starting point of the opening government was this, that we already allow parents to do bad things to their children, and this is not any more inconsistent. My first response to this, and perhaps deviating slightly from the opening opposition, is that the solution to this and our stance in closing opposition, even if it means shoving the opening opposition a bit, is that we should stop these people from doing bad things to, their parents, to these children as much. So insofar as this is concerned, we're happy to say abortion should be stopped. We are happy to say that all these things are things that they should not be allowed to do if it is already the case. But to that extent, the distinction is maintained. Okay. No thanks. The distinction is still. The distinction is still that there's a difference between the bad things that you can choose to do to someone else and the bad things that in consequently are consequently things you have no choice over. And in that extent, we're happy to say that poverty of children born into poverty are things that parents couldn't help. Are they making an active decision to disable their child? Perhaps on a very liberal interpretation of what it means to disable your child. And we're happy to say that the moral standard here, at least, is a bar to say that when you can stop things from happening, you shouldn't allow bad things to happen to your children. And that is the bar that we sustain in this debate. The second thing they then said is that, hey, look, especially in closing up, there's a lifestyle worth experiencing, and this is something that we need to enable people to understand, is in fact worth experiencing in the first place. No one is denying the fact that, quote, that disabled people have the ability to live a life worth living, but whether or not other people should be forced to share in that lifestyle is a very separate consideration more rapidly altogether. And the point is really this, everything is an alternative lifestyle to which you can choose or not choose to get into. The difference perhaps here is how objectively we can decide whether or not that lifestyle is good or bad, to which the convenient no thank you assumption that both government teams have ran in this debate to premise the entire case is that objectively speaking, a disabled lifestyle is no more difficult than a enabled one. And that is why we, you, our extension becomes extremely important because we brought to you the physical reality that their lives are systemically bad. And there are three reasons that we come to we, that want to discuss here of question whether or not their lives are in fact worse off. The first is this, and the response coming from a closing government and to the exact opening was say there's a range of choices that you can choose. Sure, but range of choices doesn't detract from the fact that the, of the quality of these choices that you can choose in the first place. Surely there is an objective decision or a metric that you can use to tell that some range of choices are systemically worse than other range of choices in and of itself. So this justification of range of choices isn't one, no thank you, the prima facie means that, that sets morality is any better, no thank you. But there are some things that you simply can't change and are not a construct of the society you believe in. Physical inabilities, the entire fact that the opening government's case revolves around saying that there is technology oh, that makes sense. their lives better, no thank you, is a fundamental concession that their lives aren't better without these forms of technology in the first place. Which means their policy or their concept exists perfectly in a world or group of people who can afford this technology to be given. What about the rest? And even if, no thank you, it was society constructed, no thank you, my suggestion here is that it is immoral to subject people in a world where you know that this is the outcome and you know that this is the one you bring these people into, and that is why, on a moral basis, that is wrong. No thank you. Uh, yeah, assuming something's coming out, no thank you. <laughs> Ration, sir. No, thank you. <laughs> but the final point that we have to contend here is that they said that while well, this makes the lives of these parents and these communities better, while well, assuming that a priori we care 
about the lives and the communities of the rights of these people more than these children. And we suggest that that shouldn't be the case. By their logic, murderers can have children who can engage themselves in extremely brutal lifestyles so they can share a relationship because that's great, right? And this apparently is a moral principle no thank you that we want to uphold and promote within all families. It begs the question why people who shouldn't have any responsibility for their death for the time of their birth should be taking up the entire responsibility of a community to break that moral barrier. And we hardly think that they should be the moral vacuum rest to enable a society or a high society to change when they shouldn't have made this decision in the first place. Information. Yes. So your moral argument is basically it is always wrong to actively choose a suboptimal choice for your child. Why is it okay for people who are already disabled to choose to have a child when they know its life will be suboptimal or for black parents to do the same? No, because this is what you already said, right? That to the extent that things you can control, you can't control. And to the extent you can't control your disability, you're happy to have people to have children, but not to make that child disabled. And that's the fundamental moral difference. But anyway, the point we're really trying to make is that the reality is that many of the policies we make in society aren't based upon the moral choices to begin with, especially even if we concede to the worst extent that these moral decisions or moral settings is incredibly great. And that is why our statute becomes incredibly pertinent. Insofar as utilitarianism is a moral principle as well, and insofar as, as how these policies are made up based upon these things, when such moral decisions are extremely great, our extension becomes extremely important. The pragmatics of things, whether or not it helps these people or not. And to that extent, we gave you two extensions that weren't dealt with. The first of which is that people react, will react differently when they realize that now the real, the real reason why you're disabled and why I am paying for, to create these ramps is because someone related to you made an active decision. It means that it's more donor fatigue. People are less willing to engage in these kinds of donations in the first place. Never mind the fact that many people make donations on the basis that they want to see these disabilities wiped off the face of this earth, and that is the strongest moral imperative that has people donating to these things in the first place. That there's a hope that every one of us can enjoy that lifestyle away from these tributes and pains in the first place. You also remove the possibility that enabled children who don't have a disability could potentially help their parents in the future. And our best place to help them, especially since they are somewhat intimately related to them, such that they can help them and are better pleased to help these communities in the first place. To that extent, Madam Chair, we're very happy to oppose. So what happens now? We have a chat. Show me the website. No, no, no. Yes, yes, yes. Madam Chair, there's nobody. Madam Chair.